Hi, I'm Christina Klimas and you are on the podcast, Building Digital Product, where we speak about the technologies that can boost your business here and now. And our today guest is Benny Robin. He is founder and CEO of Sanders, a company that offers outbound email deliverability services to assist businesses in their growth and reputation protection. In the past 20 uh, months alone, the Sanders team has sent and delivered 30 million cold emails across numerous target markets for hundreds of companies worldwide. Hello, Benny. Hello. Uh, Great nice to be to... here. Thanks for having me. Thanks you for, for accepting our invitation to be here. Uh, your product, Sanders, is a company that offers outbound cold email consultancy. What are the common cases when businesses might need such a service? When is the most relevant? Sure. So B2B outbound, for those who aren't, who don't know, B2B refers to business to business. So we're not talking about consumers. We're talking about businesses that sell to other businesses. And when sales teams go to market, there's typically three or maybe four different ways that they try to get in touch with their target audience. One of them is cold calling. One of them is LinkedIn outbound, where you send people messages on LinkedIn. And the most scalable, the one that has the widest reach is the most immediate. And oftentimes, is the most cost effective is email and email is cost effective largely because there is no owner of email it's it's a collective uh set of protocols that sit across the whole internet and everyone can access so sending an email technically doesn't cost any money that said when folks try to scale up cold email they try to do email with any sort of scale at all so they sort of go beyond maybe even a couple hundred emails a day email deliverability or sendability becomes a problem. So what my team does is we organize all the elements of email, maintain them, keep them healthy, and then coach our clients through, take control of, do everything necessary to help them scale their email sending so they can send emails at the volume that they need to send that supports their business goals. So mostly we're working with companies that are looking to scale or are having some sort of problem with what they're trying to do. And then we solve those problems. And my next question is, how does your company ensure the cost that customers' emails are delivered without ending up in the spam folders? I guess it's a problem for many companies that are now uh, venturing into cold email outreach. Sure. Well, email itself is always subject to filtration of different types. And there are email systems and servers in the world that receive emails that are always going to move some things into spam or not deliver things at all. So the idea that you can have a 0% um, spam rate or a 100% deliverability rate is not it's just not factual. It's just not the reality that most folks face. I think that in the process of scaling email, if all the things that go into email are aligned properly and done correctly, the chances that you have a spam problem becomes very, very low. It's sort of like if you, um, if, if uh, you use your knees a lot, your knees might ache, they might hurt at some point. But that's very different from actually developing some sort of serious knee problem that requires surgery or something. So we do best practices with our clients and we send a lot of emails and we understand the mechanics. So we understand the various situations that a client could be in and then how to correct for those situations and also ways to make sure that they're not uh, running towards more problems in the future. So we take a long view and uh, we're also very transparent which is nice because most of our clients we work with are venture backed or have CTOs and folks that really want to know what and why we're doing what we're doing. So that's, that's part of the, the mix that we bring to the table. And speaking about your other services, account and assistance, 
Could you please give us the list uh, of the top don't setting up called emails uh, outbounds that lead to account blocks? Maybe do you have like some tips for our listeners? Sure. There's two sides of email. There's the sending side and there's the receiving side. And if you try to send a lot of cold emails and a lot isn't very clear because a lot has different tolerances for different situations. If you try to send a lot of emails, the email service provider you're using might stop your emails from being sent at all, which means they're not even being sent. They're not even being delivered. They're not going to spam. They're not going anywhere. They're just, just basically going nowhere. So that scenario happens quite frequently. The best practice for that is to not send from places that do not want you sending from them. Pretty straightforward. The second thing is you have to be very careful with your main domain. Uh, my team doesn't set up new domains. That's not something that we do. We know and understand through all the millions of emails we sent that age domains perform better. So purchasing a brand new domain and using it for cold email isn't something that we consider best practices and we don't do with our clients. However, sending from an alternate domain or a subdomain structure is oftentimes a good strategy simply because your main domain is precious and if you cause domain reputation damage in your main domain, that can affect all the emails for your entire company, including your marketing emails, your sales emails that are not cold, um, you know, regular enterprise email, all that stuff. So I would say the best practice number two is don't send things from your main domain or don't send things from a domain that, that isn't okay being damaged or you don't have a backup plan for how to recover. And the third thing I would say is read very carefully what you're sending. Read it from as many perspectives as you can and try not to come off as pushy, aggressive, deceptive in any way. Try to not be overly friendly uh, in a way that seems fake. Try to make the call to action something sensible that the person can actually get along with and maps to your understanding of their buying position and their... Uh, so use a lot of empathy in your email and really work hard to pick it apart and ask yourself, does this have to be here? Does this make sense? Is this clear enough? Am I being really obvious? One of the phrases that we use is, is uh, bring your own context. So for example, uh, your team does product development services. Yes. If you came in with an email that was a why type email, where it was like, I'm Christina, is your company looking to get more revenue, get more clients and eventually sell for a lot of money? Well, that's weird. All those things true? Yeah, you you very well might have a very direct enterprise impact on your clients and they might actually end up generating more revenue because they have a really excellent product that you help them build. They might actually be able to build enterprise value and sell themselves for a lot more money because of the amazing product you built. So that is a why that fuels your company, but in a cold email context, the place that someone's brain goes is, well, this could be almost anything. What is this Christina person pitching? So you have to bring your own context of saying we're being very clear about what you are so as to have them, the recipient, judge you based on what you are. Because once you've identified yourself in a way that they can sort, they might say in their head, well, we are looking for someone to help us build this next phase of the product. Maybe this company is a good choice. But if they're confused as to even what you are, it makes it very tough. So I would say the first thing is uh, to go through that list of three again. First thing is make sure you're sending emails in a form and in a way that is compliant and sort of good for sending and you're not using the wrong tool for the wrong job. The second one, my, my brain's already mixed them up. My second one, what was the second one? Do you remember? <laughs> So the, sec the second one, uh, you said that don't use like any aggressive uh, language uh, or something that uh, can, uh, I don't know. Uh, no, the second one was the domain. Someone. The second uh, one was uh, the domain. I tested was... you, Christina. <laughs> uh, the second one was failed. the domain. Don't send, don't send from your main domain or a domain that 
there's a lot of domain rules and I'm not going to go to all of them because it gets a little bit silly, but domains are very precious in this scenario. And if you're sending from a domain you don't have a backup from, that's kind of tricky. And the third one is, is about the content itself. So don't be too, don't make too many assumptions and read it from as many angles as you can. Don't be too aggressive and also bring your own contact. Be very clear with it. So do the actual email text very carefully and how you're formatting it and, and writing. Those are, I think, are the three sort of earliest things that you should be thinking about in this. And then if you're really trying to scale it, that brings a whole new set of challenges that are beyond just those basic three things. And do you mean uh, by not uh, sending like all the email outreach from your domain, that means that we need to have like separate domain for email marketing. Am I right? Yes. Separate domains for email marketing, preferably aged. The way that my team does it, because there's a lot of pieces that we bring to the table when we work with our clients, because our clients are relying on us for a relatively high volume of email over a long period of time. So we charge significant amounts of money for our services, which means that it has to make sense for their ROI equation because it will increase the cost per lead by employing. So there has to be a way that they make up the difference. And the way they make it up is they have less downtime. They can usually send emails at a higher volume than they could before. And those domains and everything stay healthy longer. So one of the tactics that we use in order to keep domains healthy is we use what are called subdomains. Mm -hmm. So we do subdomains and multiple subdomains and we keep them healthy and warm and backed up and everything ready for in case there's any disruption at all. So you can do an alternate domain structure, which is instead of your main domain, it's another domain that you bought sometime far in the past that you're going to employ. You can do a subdomain structure or what's becoming more and more common is a combination of the two where you use a subdomain underneath an alternate domain. And that's the place that you scale your email from. I think that it's, it's very useful uh, for our, for everyone because uh, sometimes I also received like message from, uh, like even people that I was uh, speaking about the podcast, like our potential guest, that my email went to sp uh, spam, but I don't like uh, do it, you know, in very large numbers. I don't uh, do from my email, like email marketing. And I don't know why it happened, but I, th I think that sometimes we are just don't understand what actually can provide this problem and uh, right. not knowing it. Um, um, leads us to this problem of uh, blocking. Yeah, sure. Email, especially domains, but email in general, it must be thought of holistically. Most companies have four different ways that they send emails. One of them might be cold sales emails. The second one is regular corporate email, just the emails back and forth between you and your partners and inside, outside people. The third one is marketing emails. So emails that are sent to marketing lists that are opt-in and that's fine. The fourth one is transactional emails. So your team builds an application for a client. That application has email communication built into the application layer. Someone signs up for this, they get an email. Someone does a password reset, they get an email. Someone does it. That's an application layer. Those are typically called transactional emails. If all of those emails are being sent from your main domain, if one of them has a problem, it affects all of them very easily. So you're trying to send regular corporate mail, book some of your podcasts, you're trying to interface with them. At that same moment, maybe a salesperson is doing a pretty aggressive push with cold email. Well, if that aggressive push with cold email causes spam problems, it'll be affecting mm -hmm. your regular traffic to uh -huh. your email traffic. So you have to be very sensitive about all the different things. We, we, we use a term called email fencing, which is understanding each of these different channels of email that are inside your company and building good fences between them. Uh, and that involves subdomains, alternate domains, other things, and oftentimes different email services that you're using underneath them. So different IP addresses, that kind of thing, to make sure that they're 
separated enough uh, in order to keep the wall healthy in parallel. That makes sense. Yeah, but I think that if it will be so easy, uh, you wouldn't have like lots of the clients. That's why I like your service ex exist. Yes. Yeah, I think that best practices are much better understood with marketing emails, opt-in emails, corporate email, and um, transactional emails. And they're far less understood in terms of cold email. And there's a lot of misinformation or information that makes sense at small scales, but doesn't make sense at large scale when it comes to cold email. So the vast majority of our clients are relying on us for cold email best practices and managing the process of of keeping domains healthy and sending it at high volume. But we also end up working on other elements of email simply because they all fit together in a way. So we do get clients that come to us and say, we need help understanding our email and understanding how to make it all healthy. We're having problems here, there, whatever. And then we end up doing email fencing, setting up different things in their marketing systems, even though it doesn't relate to cold email. And sometimes we do it as a flat fee and sometimes it's incorporated into other things we're doing for clients. Thank you for sharing it. And um... I wanted to ask you like one more question uh, about your recent LinkedIn post. Uh, where you desc describe like three types of email campaign targets, namely uh, the picker, passer, and a purist, if I am pronounce uh, them correctly. And could you describe the behavior of each one of them and share how to create emails that resonate with them? Sure, you're putting me on the spot about my <laughs> most recent LinkedIn post. So I think if you remember, you asked me what are some best practices or, or things you can do, and we, we listed three things. And the third thing was about the actual email text itself. And one of the ways it makes sense to think about the person you're emailing is to understand or try to understand a little bit about how they use email themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. So I divide them into three different types. You have the picker, the passer, or the purist. So they all start with a P, which is very catchy. And each one I assigned a little emoji to. The picker is a tomato, like they pick tomatoes. The passer has a little factory, and the purist has a microscope. So uh -huh. they're like a, some sort of scientist or something. And each one of these archetypes corresponds to the way that the person treats their own email inbox. So the picker is someone, imagine it's a, a gardener who picks tomatoes. So I'm not sure if you've ever picked tomatoes, but usually if you have a dinner table and you're going to eat some tomatoes and you have a tomato garden, you go out to the garden and you pick just the ripe ones that look really good. The other ones might be good tomorrow or they may never get good, but you pick the ones that look the best for the, for the day. So the picker is going through their email inbox and just grabbing the things that look interesting or they feel like they need to take care of quickly and taking care of them. That makes sense. So oftentimes, founders of companies who are in hyper growth, they're a picker. There's just too many emails, too many things flying through. So they're just scanning their box and picking things. People who run facilities might be like that. So they might be a lot of CCs, but there's a few emails here and there of specific things they're tracking that they're going to pick out. The passer... I liken to a quality control expert on a factory line. All the emails are going by and they're pulling out specific items to send to someone else for fixing. Mm -hmm. So it's about delegation and filtering. That might be how your CEO is. Your CEO gets an email or gets a lot of emails and they might forward it to you and say, hey, check this out or look into this deeper. They're passing the emails to the right people and maybe occasionally replying to them themselves. Does that make sense? So mature company CEOs are like that. Oftentimes second time founders are passers because they've, they're not taking on all the burdens themselves. They already have a team in place. So they're passing things to the right people. Mm -hmm. What were you saying? And purist? Uh... And the purist, yeah. Purists are folks that are striving for inbox zero. They open every email. 
they deal with every email, they either archive it, reply to it, mark it as spam, do something with it, but they really carefully go through every single email they receive. Personally, I'm a purist. Um, very, my first pass in email, I do the picking, but then almost on a daily basis, I like to go through every single email and look at it and make a decision about it, no matter how many there are. That's not necessarily normal, but that is a method that people do. You find that with compliance team members are oftentimes like that. People who run operations oftentimes like that. They at least want to see every email, um, even if it's marketing, even if it's sales, whatever it is, it's in their inbox. They want to look at it even just for a second. So when you're thinking about your target market, it can oftentimes make sense to say like, are most of our people pick or pass to purists? And then you can adjust your calls to action and other elements of the email to fit who you're emailing. So for example, if you're, if you're emailing people that are large passers, then you can easily make your call to action, asking them to pass it on or telling them who you would like to pass it to. And that might increase the chances that they pass it on. Yes, agree. And I guess it also <laughs> depends on the period and maybe on the demand because uh, um, on the different domain, I am a different type of the person. For example, f for the work, I am first, I hope so. And for like, for example, my educational um, email, like educational mm -hmm. domain, I am, uh, I guess I am more picker. Yeah. You pick yeah. through it and you choose just the ones. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I have like lots of the sponsor mm -hmm. and unnecessary like information and it could be, I don't know, like uh, 20 emails per week and I rarely like check them. So that's why, you know, I guess it also depends. So you can be a seasonal picker and a seasonal purist, for example. That's true. And also a lot of folks are, if they have a primary inbox, secondary inbox set up, they're a purist with their primary inbox, but with their secondary inbox with marketing emails, maybe they're just a picker, like something catches their attention, they'll look, but if it doesn't catch your attention, they forget it or archive it or move on. I think that maybe 10 years ago, there were more purists. That was a more mm -hmm. common way to do it. I think that largely one of the reasons why cold email still works <laughs> is because a lot of the work that happens inside your company moved to chat, move to Slack and other places. So when people log into their inbox, they're outward facing. They're thinking about outside vendors that they're dealing with, they're outside things coming in. So their mentality is a little bit more, oh, the email inbox is where I go to deal with outside people. And you're an outside person trying to get into their inbox. So when they look at it, they look at it with the right context, the right frame of mind. In the past, when we started this company in 2016 and the emailing that I did before that, you'd actually get a lot of people that would be kind of upset because they saw their email inbox as an internal company space that you were invading. They'd be like, get out of my inbox. What are you doing here? But that seems to have largely shifted where now the internal stuff has moved to Slack. So the email is more for external. But what I, well, the reason why I say that is that it really comes down to how people think about the outside relationships that they have. If they're the type of person that, that deals with a lot of outside vendors and they like to be up on the information all the time, they might end up becoming a purist because they're going through it all. In other modes of business, in other contexts, they might be, as you said, and just say, well, I'm a picker. And then people can switch too. A lot of times CEOs early stage are very pure. They're trying to look at everything. And then as the company grows and they delegate more and more, they become a passer. And then eventually they might become a picker where they don't even pass everything. They only pick a few things to pass. So there can be sort of combinations. Um, and speaking about your customers, it's maybe a... Uh, where it may be a bit obvious question, but I guess that uh, every person that is sharing like their stories about it is very interesting and unique. Um, it's about um, refusing uh, cooperation with a customer because of there are like uh, too high expectations. Did you ever like face uh, this problem in, in your career or not? I went through some phases 
when I was early in my career, I didn't quite understand to the extent that you really need to partner with your clients. And it wasn't until much later that I realized that there are hard questions that you should ask your clients, and you really can't ask those questions too frequently. You can ask them very frequently. You can ask them questions like, are we doing a good job? Do you like your account manager? Do you feel confident that that this is worth the money you're spending? Do you feel like we're on track? Do you feel like we're off track? Are you happy about the results you've had to date? Are you confident that the next period is going to be beneficial? Does the ROI make sense? Is the ROI making sense? Did the ROI make sense? You can actually very frequently ask these questions, even on a weekly basis or even daily. And there's sort of no problem with it. I think that on a personal level, it's different. Meaning if every single time you talk to a friend, you said, how are you doing? How are you really doing? How do you feel today? How do you, it can get a little bit weird because you actually want to hang out and sort of forget your troubles, but there's something about a work relationship, especially a vendor and client relationship that almost needs to be interrogated. You need a lot of feedback. <laughs> Questions like, do you feel like we're moving too slow? Do you feel like it's about feeling, but the feeling has some distance because you're, you're, you have a shared objective. If that makes sense, you have a shared goal. So yes, I think yes, that agree. that's one thing that I learned as I get older. And I'm, I don't know with video and stuff, maybe I look very young, but I'm not especially young. In my first business, I tried to avoid hard questions because it's a, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, you don't want to poke the bear. You don't want to ask a question and then you have to deal with the ramifications. So if there's a problem, they'll speak up. And as I get older, I encourage my team and I try to ask many, many more questions. Does the ROI make sense? Is the ROI making sense? Do you feel like the ROI will start to make sense? Those, those kinds of things, I think are pretty important. Yeah, I get that um, it's important to ask uh, whether like customer is satisfied with your services, but it's also important to, uh, yeah, to understand this distance of not uh, um, asking too much unnecessary things, because sometimes they are just satisfied with what you are doing and uh, you can ask them, I don't know, 100 questions, uh, doesn't have like responses and trying to overthink, maybe it's something wrong with your team or with your process or with your work and everything is just fine and people just busy and they sometimes um afraid to give you feedback or are very busy to to do it yeah so sincere feedback is quite difficult but i think that after the cooperation started you just need to have this first call uh to like to be quick to have some improvements if the customer uh, isn't satisfied with something, for example, to change the team member or uh, to provide like some additional services that they uh, like need. Yeah. So maybe it will help. Yeah. I think that, I think you're right in some way. In my personal experience, it is totally fine to ask very frequent for very frequently. And oftentimes it extends the lifetime and the satisfaction of a client if they're, if they're being asked and the, and the asking can be on a very, very small level or, or much larger level. So the, like you said, do you like your account management? Is the account management serving you? Are you getting along with them? Do you feel like they're good and competent? It's a good thing to ask maybe after the first two, three, four weeks of them working with them, because if there is a problem, you can change the account manager. But I think that even once the account manager is in place, there's always those frictions where a client might think you're not moving as fast as they would like. Well, that's a small thing, but if enough of those build up, they start to think, man, I'm not sure if these folks are as competent as I thought they were. But the second someone asks, do you feel like this is moving too slow? Or this was the calendar we gave you or the schedule we gave you at the beginning of the engagement as far as we can tell, we're on track. 
I assume that you agree. And if you don't, if you feel like this is going slower than you need or want, we'd love for you to say it so we can try to figure out if there's ways we can accelerate or change the order of the rollout or whatever. I think that like calling these things out can be really helpful and make clients feel good. And also the other thing is oftentimes you ask a question that's hard and the answer is, yeah, everything's great. We love that. But simply by asking the question, you give them permission to share a different issue that they're dealing with. And the last thing is, as you said, which I totally agree with, sometimes when you ask a question, like, do you like your account manager? Do you feel like this is on track? Do you, do you, do you, how do you feel? How do you feel? How do you feel? How do you feel? They say, Hey, everything's good with you, but we have this other vendor we're dealing with that's really not going well with, does your team want to take over this work? Nine times out of 10, that other vendor might have a sense that something's wrong, but they didn't ask directly. So that client feels more comfortable taking the work from someone else and giving it to you because you're communicating with them. You're asking the question, you know, that, that, uh, you're, you're on the call, you're uncovering their feelings when the other client maybe is just doing the work and delivering it. So I think that communication at that level is important. And maybe in some clients, in some contexts, it's a bad idea. Maybe with very large enterprises, it's better not to ask. I don't know. Just in my experience with the types of clients we deal with, that kind of communication seems to work very, very well and, and help helps a lot. And I find that most issues with clients typically come from communication issues, mm -hmm. unless there's like actual things like, yeah, but like uh, if they are running out of money and they will tell you it, so you can, I don't know, change some package uh, or will try to, you know, fit this budget uh, and will not like lose this cooperation. Yeah. But, and, but not telling you, uh, the truth, uh, the everything, uh, is failing. Yeah. That's I, I, I agree. I, I always say that, and maybe you've experienced this with clients as well. I always call it, I want to stay on the same side of the table as that. So if you think about a classic negotiation where there's people on one side of the table and people on the other side, and they're going back and forth to, to, uh, debate or argue over something, I want to be on the same side of the table as that. I want to be with them looking at something and working on it rather than facing each other. Oftentimes with clients, there's a sort of magical moment, magical, mystical, weird moment where they switch sides of the table. And it could be that they're running out of money or they feel like the budget is whatever. Something's happening. And suddenly inside their company, someone says, hey, maybe you should talk to this vendor and see if you can get a discount or something or something, whatever, like whatever happens. And then all of a sudden you get in the meeting and they're on the other side of the table from you. And you're like, well, how'd that happen? We were on the other side of the table just a little bit. Ago. So I find that really constantly thinking about what side of the table you're on and trying to keep them on the same side of the table as you and you trying to stay on the same side of the table as them is an ongoing work task with clients. And if they come at you in a way that seems, wait a minute, we were partners just a few days ago and now we're enemies. Like, hmm, how's this going to go? You have to work really hard to say, okay, well, let's get back on the same side of the table. I had a, a incident with a client just yesterday where they, the project was going very well from our perspective. I say project, but most of our clients are ongoing, but it was the early stages was going very well, but there was a person in the middle who the boss wasn't sure if they were handling their project well. So that created a conflict and created a conflict because not only did we have to help the big boss understand if the person that we're dealing with is the right person to deal with, but then the big boss needed to understand what we were doing to assess the whole situation. So that means that they're coming in from an assessment perspective, not as a participant, which means that we're on the opposite sides of the table. So the first thing you have to do is say, establish that you're on the same side of the table, that you have a shared objective, that all the elements that were put in place by the person in the middle are changeable, editable, fixable. We can get this back to where it was. And then that big boss calms down. Okay, great. We have a vendor that we can work with. I like vendors I can work with. 
We have a vendor that's coachable. I like people that are coachable. How are we going to revive this relationship to get on the right track? And after 20, 30 minutes of this kind of realignment discussion, it feels like it's on track. They say, yes, of course, we'll continue. Sounds great. Let's have a meeting tomorrow. We can dig into more details. And now it feels like it's going to be moving in the right direction. But again, they came into it opposite side of the table when literally just a few days before we felt like we were on the same side of the table. So I think that this kind of client management piece is really hard. It's ongoing. It's always a challenge. People are the most complicated kinds of systems you have to deal with, <laughs> I think. But I, I guess it, it's really individually that ev everyone, you know, like is different type of the person. That's why it's, um, you need to understand like the person very well to understand how it's better to communicate with, uh, with her. And, um, sometimes, uh, it's better to use, for example, calls, uh, instead of the text messages to, uh, to understand, you know, this, uh, to find this deep connection between you and the person and try to uh, build this, um, uh, trust between you and try to ask like all the questions that you needed and try to, I don't know, uh, to make this eye breaking moment when you, uh, trust each other and person didn't afraid to tell you something. And, uh, as you mentioned that you are on the same. Uh, part of the table as your customers it uh, shows them that you um, really care uh, about them and this empathy I, I guess means a lot yeah yeah I totally agree we all know that marketing uh, has changed a lot over the past few years and how has this affected outbound email marketing? And how does it compare to LinkedIn outreach? Do you know? Email is so much more scalable than LinkedIn that email truly is an open platform. And there doesn't seem to be too many things that are going to stop email from being effective. LinkedIn outbound is owned by Microsoft. So you're playing in Microsoft's uh, pool they could effectively end it. There are many ways that they could limit it in such a way that it makes it very, very difficult to do without paying them directly. So LinkedIn can be effective, but in sort of orders of magnitude, different. If you want to do 40 LinkedIn messages a day cold, that might be a challenge. If you want to do 400, most of our clients have between 400 and 4,000 cold emails a day without any issue. So that's a very, very different scale. So that's my feeling is that since Microsoft took over, LinkedIn outbound has become constricted and Google is also constricting cold email in certain ways, but LinkedIn is far more constricted than cold email is and probably will remain like that for a while. Yeah, I guess that LinkedIn has like much more limitations, uh, especially like connections, invites, and uh, yep. nothing can uh, save you. Sometimes they will just block your account forever and you can have, I don't know, whole life there. And the, yeah, so it can be really painful experience for uh, entrepreneurs, especially. And the last question from the section is about your tool, uh, um, for email spam test, email spam test tool. Sure. Uh, and it seems to be free of charge and helpful it's free, for, yeah. for businesses. And can you please describe how it can benefit businesses and how, uh, for example, I and my company can use it? Sure. So we built this spam tester on our website. And what you do is you send an email to a specific address and then it helps analyze your DNS records and give you pointers on what areas you need to improve in order to uh, get your emails delivered better. We use it purely as a, as a lead gen thing. People come to the website and they use it and then we reach out to them if it seems like they're a kind of company that fits our target audience. Uh, that's basically what it is, but it's, it's very, uh, simple and straightforward. 
And we're probably going to be rolling out a few other free tools that are in a similar vein um, pretty soon that are designed to help people get a little bit further to understanding their own issues before they have to talk to someone like us. Uh, yeah, I think that it's very nice solution and strategy to uh, like create uh, free tools that can uh, be interested your target audience and actually to have all the, the, these connections that might need your own services and you are just uh, need to contact them. It's very smart. And right now we will move to the section uh, which is called flash questions and I will give you two, op two options and you need just to pick the one. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Yeah. Uh, base plane or email campaign setup? Oh, that's tricky. Recently, I've been playing a lot of more keyboard, more keyboard and piano. Um, I would probably leave the email campaign setup to my team to handle, and I would play some music. It's also a bit tricky, but I guess that uh, you will uh, do it uh, quicker. Uh, New York or Tokyo? Right now in New York, but I'll be back in Tokyo uh, probably twice this year, and I try to go twice a year. So, But I, I think I prefer New York now. Tokyo is great, but I prefer New York now. Uh, HTML email or plain text? Mm -hmm. For cold email, plain text, for sure, for sure. Being a CEO or employee? <laughs> I've almost never been an employee my whole life. I have experimented with it twice, but I much prefer being a CEO. So maybe it's, you know, <laughs> this, you are born with the sense that you don't want to be an employee and you wanted to start your own project and you feel the sense of responsibility. Sometimes I, I get um, it's really common for employees, but not of not like for um, not, not every time because also like people from corporations starting their own company. But it's interesting to understand how you came here and how you decided to become an CEO. Yeah, I think that I usually, I mean, for me personally, I was never really invited into any company and I didn't really have a career track that felt like, oh, I want to work for this company or that company. So there was sort of very early on in my early 20s, I thought, okay, this is something that I could do and I can understand it and I could control my own destiny to a certain extent. So I never felt that working for a company was easier or less risky than doing something on my own. That's sort of how I ended up doing it. And then the two times I experimented with working for companies, I always maintained clients outside as well. And I, so I felt more like I was a, uh, like on a long contract with them. And I learned a lot from those experiences, but ultimately, at least at this phase of my life, I'm much happier to be a CEO and have my own team. Yes, it's great that you um, that you like where you are at the right at the right period of this time. Yeah, it's great to feel uh, this um, calmness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so thank you, Benny, for uh, this mm -hmm. interview. It was really nice to speak with you and to have like some mm -hmm. common things uh, uh, between us. Yes. Yeah, so thank you one more time for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Yeah, it was really interesting. Great. Yeah, so na uh, have a nice day and um, speak with you mm -hmm. soon. Thank you. Bye. Hit like and subscribe button to not skip the following episodes. Bye.